السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ a very good evening to all the doctors and the medical fraternities who have come online for today's webinar entitled pediatric gastroenterology and hepatology organized by dubai pediatric club in affiliation with new country healthcare restore of flora and odessa today with me in the panel we have the office bearers of dubai pediatric club dr saharab dr kalpana and dr diari along with dr ahmed alam the brand manager of odessa so before proceeding i would like to ask dr saharab to give the welcome note and to to start with the proceedings dr saharab please uh, good evening thank you very much uh, tofir good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen let me share my slides Uh, is it okay am i audible yes doctor please uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen <clears throat> on behalf of the uh, members of the organizing committee of dubai pediatric club and also members of dubai pediatric club i would like to welcome all viewers from uae and other countries to this webinar this webinar is sponsored by new country healthcare i would like to thank the manager of this company mr tawfiq ali today we have uh, two eminent uh, speakers professor anil dawan from uk and dr dalia belsha the profile has been uh, circulated in a short file i'll be introducing them well this is a beautiful uh, dubai sheikh zayed road with the burj khalifa those who have not seen i would like to welcome them to come to dubai and see this city members of dubai pediatric club in the second and fifth annual conference well the members of organizing committee and executive committee dr joshi dr kalpana dr ayman dr amir dr diari dr rafia dr bandari dr bushra and dr khalid well today we have two eminent uh, speakers our today's topic is pediatric gastroenterology and hepatology of course dr uh, dalia will be talking about interesting cases and professor dawan will talk about the uh, infantile cholestasis professor dawan is director of research and innovation kings college hospital also director of pediatric liver gi and nutrition center and movat labs at kings uh, college hospital london uk dr dalia is a consultant pediatric gastroenterologist at american hospital dubai we have also Uh, two moderators uh, dr uh, kalpana singh gupta senior specialist pediatrician head of department of pediatrics at nmc specialty hospital dubai she is also secretary of the dubai pediatric club we have also with us uh, dr diari mohammad senior consultant pediatric surgeon at latifa hospital and also member of the executive committee so Well, this is Mr. Tofiq Ali, the business country manager, who always support us in all our uh, DPC events. Well, about the future meetings, next month we will have uh, uh, on Friday, 26 February, Dr. Samir Dalvai. He will be talking about developmental and behavioral disorders in children. On Friday, 12 March, we will have uh, a talk on Kawasaki, none other than Professor Sujit Singh. from pg india chandigarh india this year we will have our annual conferences in the form of bi annual conferences at the end of may and end of november details will be announced well i'll give a brief uh, history of uh, gastroenterology and hepatology you see here i always start in the memory of hippocrates the father of medicine see here also he is examining a child is palpating the liver of the child in 400 bc first he described hepatic abscess hippocrates and as you see he says here all disease begin in the gut which is true well briefly about the history of gastroenterology the usage of gastroenteritis first it was in 1825 before that time it was commonly known as typhoid fever or cholera morbus in 1805 
Bozzini made the earliest description of endoscope. And in 1868, Adolf Kusmar, whose name is very familiar to all in Kusmar breathing, a well-known German uh, physician, developed the gastroscope. Interestingly, he perfected the technique on a sword swallow. Those who are coming in talent show they are uh, swallowing the sword, so he practiced on that. Dr. Schindler is considered as a father of gastroscopy. He and his colleague Wolf developed the semi-flexible gastroscope in 1932. And in 1957, Dr. Ilkovich introduced the first prototype of fiber optic gastroscope. Well, in England, Dr. Samuel Gies contributed to the development of a specialty in London, focusing on the uh, cystic fibrosis and cyclic vomiting. Well, the first national gastrointestinal society was created in Germany by Dr. Boas. This is Dr. Boas and Dr. Gies in 1920. Later, the American Gastroenterological Society was founded by Dr. Stuart in 1897. Pediatric gastroenterology as a specialty emerged in 60s. Well, she is Dr. Margaret Schindler. Uh, he, she is considered to be the, um, I mean, the originator of the pediatric gastroenterology, although she was an adult gastroenterologist, but uh, she studied a lot in uh, pediatric on biopsy, doing biopsies. Well, the first center, regarding the first center, it was not uh, uh, until early 1960s that the center for GI disorder in children began to emerge in North America, Great Britain, Australia, and Europe. Regarding this milestone, this Dr. Wages working in Netherlands with his colleague, Dr. Kammer, who was a biochemist, and Dr. Deke developed the first center for pediatric uh, gastroenterology. Well, regarding the pediatric uh, hepatology, the pediatric hepatology in Europe be be began in a center called uh, Bicenter Hospital in 1964 when Professor Daniel Alagin was appointed as the head of that unit. You will hear today a lot about the allergy syndrome. Dr. Professor Dawan will be talking about that. The first liver transplant was in Paris and performed in 1981 by Professor Bismuth. As you see here, this is Dr. Allergy. But this was partial, I mean, the transplant. But the full transplant, the first human liver transplant performed in 1963. This was the full transplant by Dr. Starzel on a three-year child in the United States. In Britain, the first center for pediatric hepatology was developed at King's College Hospital in London in 1970 by Professor Alex Mowat. Now Professor Dawan is there. You see here Professor Dawan and this is King's College. Well, Dr. Dawan was joined by Professor Howard who had a particular interest in Kasai photoenterostomy for biliary attrition was considered a world expert in this. Now here you see Professor Howard and a uh, ward was uh, named after him. Here you see Professor Dawan here in the center and here you see Dr. Mowat with Queen. The publication of Mowat's first book Liver disorder in children in 1979 indicated that pediatric hepatology had become now a distinct subject. I had the opportunity to meet Professor Darwin in early 90s and suggest uh, regarding the first addition, he was happy. He promised to incorporate some of these changes, but unfortunately in 1995, on 11 November, after attending a conference in Chile, just after his presentation, he got sudden cardiac arrest and unfortunately he passed away. Here you see the Professor Mowat with William Ballistic. William Ballistic is also one of the pioneers of pediatric gastroenterology and hepatology is in Cincinnati College in the United States. 
He, uh, he had a review work and development of the subspecialty of hepatology. He published it in hepatology. He talks about a, a lot about Professor Mowat. Uh, Dr. Balisti also received an award on uh, 2013 from United States for 40 years of service in the field of pediatric gastroenterology and pathology. This is the third edition of the Professor Mowat uh, book. I'm going a bit fast. Here you see Professor Mowat in a nice picture with his colleagues. Well, this is American Association for a Study of Liver Disease, where you see here uh, Dr. Balistri with other senior members. Well, pediatric hepatology in London in 1989, Second National Center was developed at Birmingham and, uh, under the guidance of Dr. Kelly. Alex Mowat held the first chair of pediatric hepatology in the United Kingdom, followed by do Dr. Meli Vergani and both from University of London and subsequently by Dr. Kelly. They are the very well-known figure in the United uh, Kingdom. All the uh, gastroenterologists and hepatologists they know and they are the pioneers of the Espagon. Now regarding the uh, society that uh, Espagon, in November 1967, Dr. Vigers took the initiative to set the Society for Pediatrician whose main discipline was pediatric gastroenterology. This led to the foundation of European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, gastroenterology that time called ESPG, in 1976. At the Weimar meeting, nutrition was added to that. And then uh, North American uh, Society, which is called NASPAGAN, it was initiated in 90, early 60s by Dr. Kreshman, who is also one of the pioneers in this field. Well, in 1989, the, I mean, they started this pathology in the early 90s, H was added to the Espagan. And right from the beginning, Espagan hepatology played an important role. And members, especially Alex Mover, Daniel Aragil, and others, as you see, Dr. Vergani, Kelly, and this Martin Mugdeski. Martin Mugdeski, I will tell about that. They actually contributed a lot and wrote in the Journal of the um, Espigan, which is here, Journal of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition. Well, something about this Dr. Kasai, today you'll hear a lot about the Kasai, very interesting thing I would like to tell you. I'm going a bit fast because we have to have I mean, the speaker. <clears throat> Morio Kasai was a Japanese surgeon who had a strong interest in pediatric surgery. He is best known for devising a surgical procedure, hepatoportoenterostomy for biliary atresia. It is also interesting to know that American surgeon William Ladd, who is the father of pediatric surgery, had earlier described the surgery, but in 1920s, but this is uh, known after the Kasai. Now, I'd like to draw your attention here. It is very interesting. One day, this Dr. Kasai, while operating, uh, uh, he found that bleeding in the porta hepatis while uh, trying to dissect the ductules in an infant. To try to stop the bleeding, he attached a loop of the child's duodenum over the porta hepatis. The bleeding is stopped and the team was surprised to find bile in the feces after the surgery. Kasai published the work and the procedure in the Japanese journal in 1959. But the work was not widely known outside uh, Japan until he published it in Journal of Pediatrics in 1968. Now it is interesting to know that the surgery became known as Kasai procedure, but he himself was so humble that he was uncomfortable having this name uh, to be made after him. Well, this is the history of Mowat's lab. It started from 1966 till those who are interested, they can find it. It is interesting to know that in 2014, they had 1,000 pediatric liver transplantation, 1,000. So I'm going faster. Now here you see, uh, on the 18th, uh, 2018, it was the 12th uh, Mowat Symposium. Uh, you see Professor Dawan here with the uh, Mowat family, Anna and Adrian, in this conference. Well, and this is the same thing I said, Martin Bogdeski. 
He's a pioneer of the Espegan, and he, he actually published an article on uh, April 2018 about the history of pediatric hepatology in Espegan. They had actually this monotemic uh, uh, conference in 2009. It was in United Kingdom and organized by Professor Davan. Well, this is Professor Davan, his books, he has a lot of publications just I kept here. Very brief, I mean, uh, the profile of both the speakers have been circulated. Just uh, quickly, I will just say Professor Darwin is consultant pediatric, in pediatric pathology with a special interest in liver cell transplantation, immunosuppression after liver transplantation, Wilson disease, neonatal cholestasis, and acute liver failure. Dr. Darwin is well known inter internationally and as well, or currently holds board level appointment with the European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition, International Liver Transplantation Society and Cell Transplantation Society. Professor Darwin qualified from prestigious institute PGI Chandigarh from India and has since held appointments in the United States and UK. He is a clinical academic group leader at the King's College. So, uh, of course, detailed uh, CV of Dr. Darwin is there. It is, I mean, everybody knows him, he's very famous. Now I will briefly introduce Dr. Um, Dalia Belsha, our next uh, speaker, Dalia. Dr. Dalia Belsha is a consultant pediatric gastroenterologist and chief of the Department of Pediatrics at American Hospital, Dubai. Dr. Belsha has 14 years of experience in UK National Health Services, she was trained first in pediatrics and then in the subspecialty of pediatric gastroenterology. Dr. Dalia also focused on pediatric hepatology and nutrition. Dr. Belcher performed thousands of upper GI endoscopies and colonoscopy for children aged one month to 21 years. She worked as a consultant at a renowned international pediatric gastroenterology center at the Sheffield Children's Hospital, UK and then as a consultant at the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital, the largest pediatric hospital in Europe. She was the lead pediatric uh, endoscopy service at Manchester and recognized pediatric endoscopy trainer. So with this, I, I end again, I go to Hippocrate, all diseases begin in the gut. So just wanted, I wanted to request my colleagues to recommend adult patients all to go and get the vaccine. Since Mona Lisa gets vaccine and wear mask, so recommend all to get vaccine and wear mask. Beautiful Dubai, I invite all those who have not seen Dubai to come to Dubai and visit, this is the best time. I end, I would like to request all viewers to write their question in the question and answer box. After that, uh, com com when the speakers, they finish their talk, we we'll have uh, question and answer with Dr. Kalpana and Dr. Diari. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. And I'm sure it's the evening for you. It's a bit late, nine o'clock for your time. Uh, I'm very grateful for you, all of you to join. I see more than 300 people listening to the talk. That's very good. Uh, Sorab, uh, it reminds me of my days in PGI when we worked together long, long time back. And thank you for giving the introduction of the field of pediatric gastroenterology. I will be showing some of these pictures again because just to put the context. This is the modern King's College Hospital, but uh, Saurav showed you is our older wing and this is where we practice. Now coming to the topic of infantile cholestasis, I think I'm going to put you in perspective. The prevalence of jaundice in UK, in that jaundice means just yellow color, could be unconjugated, conjugated. So it's very common. A lot of you are neonatologists and you see it all the time. But I want to emphasize that any jaundice that's more than 14 days is not good. And a half a percent of these will continue, will come out to be a conjugated jaundice. So it is not uncommon. We all know when we read about it, but when we practice, we try to delay the investigation of jaundice beyond two weeks, which is not correct. The most important condition that get missed, which has a timelines and indications for treatment earlier on is biliary atresia and its incidence is one in 17,000 words. Now, let me give you a perspective. So 
we looked at the data from 1970 to 1990, so 20 years. I started at King's College in 92. So we looked at 1,000 patients who presented to us with infantile cholestasis. What we see here is most common cause of our patients' diagnosis was biliary atresia. One third were indeterminate and then 18% metabolic, 9% infective, and 8 6% those days we identified as allergy syndrome, bile duct hypoplasia. Just keep a picture of this slide in your mind. How does it look like? Now I'm going to turn the clock to forward, 92 to 2005. So that's another about 17, 18 years of time. And what you find is that the pie chart has changed. There are several more things has been added. Biliary atresia has dropped from 33% to 20%, and idiopathic has increased to 40%, but conditions like alpha-1, conditions like PFIC has been added on to it, and parental nutrition-related liver disease. So what happened to biliary atresia? The incidence didn't go down, but as Saurabh in, showed you that in 1989, another center was added in Birmingham, and year 2000, another center was ad added in Leeds. So in UK, there are only three centers that can do pediatric liver disease. Not everybody is allowed to do it. Hence, the previously, when there was King's was the only center, everything was coming to King's. Now we share it with other two centers. Nonetheless, we still continue to do about 55% of the whole country's liver disease work in children at King's College Hospital London. Now, parental nutrition was added on because of prematurity and people, children were living longer and shortcut children were not left to die, but started on parental nutrition. And metabolic and alpha-1 antitrypsin, et cetera, were added on, which I will discuss with more details. So if you look at the concept of infantile cholestasis, which is jaundice in, in, in anybody from newborn to one or two years of age, depending on what you call as an infant, I want to give it three presentations. So infantile cholestasis could be a presentation of either a metabolic liver disease or a biliary atresia or obstructive liver disease, in other words, we want to call it, or a progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis. So I'm putting three into these major groups, infective, et cetera. I'm not discussing those because you guys know than, more than I know about those conditions. And I want to categorically say, categorically say, that CMV hepatitis is overrated, overrated. There is usually another diagnosis which get diagnosed as CMV. So please, when you make a diagnosis of CMV, look for other things. Now, what I want to also emphasize is that in about 30% of patients, the diagnosis is disease specific. So every disease has its own diagnosis, own test. So you have to do that test. Metabolic, have every condition have their own test. Infections, for that matter, you do a torch screenings. For every single disease, there is a test. Endocrinopathies, colidocal cyst get diagnosed on ultrasound or MRCT. But in 70%, now remember, 70% is a very big number. In 70% of patients, there is no single test that will make the diagnosis. And to your surprise, biliary atresia is one of that condition. Then other condition, allergy and others will come, I will show you. So what I'm trying to say is that you end up doing more than one test to reach at a diagnosis of a condition, not one single test. You can argue allergy syndrome. Yes, you do mutations analysis, but there are more patients who are mutation positive than they have a disease. So just having a mutation for allergy doesn't make them a disease. Liver biopsy still continues to be an important picture of the jigsaw. Now, if you are confronted with a child who has conjugated jaundice more than two weeks of age, I think you should, three things you should come to your mind. Three things, nothing more than that. You need to focus on identifying a treatable condition. Don't keep repeating tests. Just focus on what is treatable that you can do. Nobody will punish you for missing a rare syndrome, but people will punish you if you miss biliary atresia if you miss tyrosinemia, if you make galactosemia, because they are treatable conditions. Second thing you need to remember is recognize complications. Complications because of cholestasis. One simple example is vitamin K deficiency. I don't know how many you order prothrombin time or INR as a first test in a cholestatic child rather than an ultrasound. If you ask me, 
if one single test I'm going to do in a child with prolonged jaundice or cholestatic condition, I will do INR or bit prothrombin time because if there is a vitamin K malabsorption, child has a risk of bleeding and it could be fatal bleeding. So recognize complications, multiple like vitamin deficiencies, K, D, and bone disease, nutritional complications. Third thing, early referral depends where you work. If you work in a hospital that has got everything, surgical backup, transplantation, then you don't need to worry about referral, then you know where you are sitting. But if you do not have the backup for all the management, please consider referral. That doesn't mean you need to send the patient. It means you make a telephone contact or make some kind of a contact with the chosen center of your choice. Now, we all are doctor clinicians. We want to look at patient and make a diagnosis by just looking at them which is very rarely positive in this condition. But if you are lucky, if you have a cutaneous hemangioma, it may suggest a liver hemangioma. If you feel a cystic mass, very rare, it could be polydocal cyst. If you have a micropenis baby, it could be septoptic dysplasia. If you have white hair of the child, it could be HLH-like presentation. If you have ascites, which is a kind of discoloration, I will show you some picture that could be spontaneous perforation of the bile ducts storage disorders, et cetera. Now, this is a picture of a child who had a spontaneous perforation of the bile duct. What you see here is, is discoloration of with bile of the scrotum. If you do a HIDA scan on this child, you will see the whole abdominal cavity lights up. So you don't need much, you made a diagnosis. Even if I'm like us, if you find there is a bluish halo, which gives you a indication that this child has a bile leak, ruptured bile inside his abdominal cavity. So, Going forward, I'm going to discuss these three major conditions. What are most of them? Diagnosis and management. If you look at first metabolic liver disease, you can have the common feature of metabolic liver disease would be positive family history, unexplained neonatal death, multiple miscarriages, consanguinity because the genetic pool, recurrent episodes of unexplained vomiting and cephalopathy, developmental delay regression, and sometimes dysmorphism. Then you can have it some disease specific clinical clues. If you have coarse faces, gangliosidosis, etc., macroglacia, GM1, gangliosidosis. If you have a diarrhea of a child, cystic fibrosis, Wolman's disease. And these are the conditions where jaundice is a predominant presentation, I mean. Okay, jaundice with the diarrhea in a newborn and infant could be Wolman's, could be cystic fibrosis. Mild lymphadenopathy is seen in Wolman's or Gauche's. If you have upward gaze paralysis, Gauche's disease, and cherry red spot, I will show you Neiman pick type C or gangliosidosis. Abnormal smell, in other words, odor, sweaty feet, rancid fishy or cabbage like, and tyrosinemia. So these are rare occurrences, but if you once you smelled it, you won't forget it. I will give you some clinical presentations. This is a Zellweger child, you know. So it's a, a Zellweger syndrome where you have a problem with the very long chain fatty acids. They're floppy, they're frog-like, hypotonic. But if you are lucky, very rarely, you can find patellar calcifications. And the diagnosis is made while you wait for special tests. Carbohydrate glycosylation defects. You will find fatty atrophy, atrophy of the gluteal fat, inverted nipples, and a lot of ecchymosis or because they have a coagulation, coagulopathy. If you have a rickets in a child like this, broken bones, then tyrosinemia is another condition. This is interesting. This child is not flexing his, this arm, these legs. And what is the problem is, because if we have flexed this arm and this leg, there is a stricture formation earlier on. And this is called uh, ARC complex, means this is a arthrogryposis, renal and cholestasis complex. It's a genetic disorder, but progressive cholestasis with joint problems and cholestasis and renal failure. This is a child with cleft lip left lip with micropenis is septopic dysplasia. If you have a cataract, cherry red spot, bone marrow examination shows this. If you see this macrophage, which has got laden with foamy macrophages with some specific features on it, it's a bone marrow examination of a child with Nyman pick type C. So adrenal calcifications, involvements, stippled epiphysis I showed you, and rickets in tyrosinemia. These are the radiological clues. Now, this is a list of condition, and this list keeps increasing every year because newer and newer genetic metabolic conditions are added on. 
Now, what is important? So when you're suspecting a metabolic disorder in an infantile cholestasis or a child with a prolonged jaundice, this is the set of minimum set of investigations you should carry out. You should carry out blood sugars every six hours, particularly if there's a history of hypoglycemia. Make sure you do blood sugar before feeding, not after feed, so pre-food blood sugar. Lactate pyruvate, blood gas will give you a pH, uric acid, ammonia, CK, transferrin electrophoresis. Save a blood sample before you transfuse the child. Because if you were to do genetic studies or enzyme analysis after blood transfusion, your assay may not be relevant. So save a EDTA sample or a clotted sample if the child is sick and you think you're going to have a transfusion. Then you do a urinary investigation like reducing substances, amino acids are more or less important but organic acids are more important because that will give you an idea of organic acidemias for that matter, or tyrosinemia, one of them. Bile acids, this is a quantitative, qualitative analysis of the bile acids, not easily done, but something to think about. And electrolytes, if you're suspecting like endocrinopathies. Now, these are the disorders where you do need to send a specific test. There is no shortcut. Even if you do whole exome sequencing and some of you are doing it, you don't get everything in the end because they are looking at something which they think they know. So for these conditions, every disease has its own diagnostic test. And the list continues, but if you are suspecting on those lines, you have no shortcut, but you have to send white cell enzymes for lipid disorders, and these are the examples. Liver biopsy, by and large, liver biopsy in metabolic liver disease will be like this. There will be fatty change, sometimes macrovesicular, sometimes microvesicular. So it gives you an idea, but it doesn't give you a definitive diagnosis. Sometimes you see megamitochondria, but that's not diagnostic. But liver biopsy, this kind of biopsy in a neonatal cholestasis child puts it in the path of metabolic disorders. So liver biopsy is guiding, but it's not diagnostic. Sometimes it's diagnostic, but most of the time it's guiding. Now let's switch to the next group of conditions which is most common, third, one third of our patients come to us with a prolonged jaundice with this condition is biliary atresia. So babies with biliary atresia look normal. And this is a, a sad part of it. They look normal. Nobody, until you see the stool color and stool color could be very likely like this, not a pigmented stool. So unless you look at a stool color, you wouldn't know there is anything wrong with this child. So these are hungry babies generally because they are malabsorbing their food because of poor bile flow. So people think if the baby is feeding well, everything is good. That is wrong in biliary atresia, unfortunately. For the first few weeks, they will thrive and look at this baby's well thriving baby. So remember, 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 babies with biliary atresia look normal. That's when they deceive you. And you keep asking them to come every week, see the jaundice will disappear. You pray, the family prays, show them to the sun. But by the time it's eight, 10 weeks, then we all say, oh, now we have missed the boat. The incidence of condition is about 14,000 to 21,000, depending on where, what part of the world you live. It's more common in French Polynesia, in Pacific Islands, but in UK, the incidence is about one in 14,000. So, Saurabh alluded to Dr. Kasai, and we talk about a little bit about this. So, biliary atresia is a condition which is a problem with the damage of the bile ducts. So, here we have a normal porta hepatis. So, you have a gallbladder, it's a common duct, and what you have cystic duct, and that right and left hepatic duct. And then they join in, and what is common duct is joining into the pancreatic duct and becoming coming to the intestine. Now, what you see if you do a Liver biopsy, you see multiple bile ducts, proliferation of the bile ducts. And if you section a duct, then you find the atritic duct and there is not much lumen in it. So it's already atritic biliary tree. If you look at the original presentation by John Thompson, long time back from Edinburgh physician in 1892, what you find here is a, a very atritic biliary tree. This is the gallbladder, but it's very thin atritic system. So there are types of biliary atresia, the type one, which is very, very uncommon, less than 8%. And this is where the obstruction is found at this level, 
but you can see the lumen is open up to this level, up to the common hepatic duct level, common bile duct level. Then type two, it, the lumen is open up to common uh, hepatic duct. And type three, when there is no lumen and you have to go up to porta hepatis, may, means beyond first and the second order ducts. Why does this matter? Because it, the prognosis of type one and type two is much, much superior to type three. So jaundice clearance and long-term survival and outcome of patients with type one and type two is far superior to type three. Now, the question always comes, what causes biliary atresia? And it's a conundrum. We don't know, okay? So there is a one group we find polycyplenia. We call it uh, uh, hepatic embryopathy related or biliary atresia splenic malformation syndrome. It's usually, we think, associated with first trimester insult, usually history of maternal diabetes. Then the second group, we find viral infections, which we think people have so many theories and animal models of rotavirus, rheoviruses are there. And then we think it's a perinatal viral infection in a predisposed individual that causes damage to the bile ducts. Then a lot of studies has been done from King's College Hospital and others looking at immune damage and immune system downregulation of Tregs and upper agonism CD4, CD56 counts. That is contributory. Uh, People believe it could be genetic. We have done a lot of work in I'm collaboration with the University of Pittsburgh and Yale School of Medicine. We have looked at a big population, but we are not able to find a single gene. There are so many genes that contribute. There should be maybe contributory, but there is no gene defect that we have found. So the condition nonetheless is still stays unknown. Etiology, several theories are there, but we do not know that one definitive cause, what causes biliary atresia. Uh, but we do know that if you delay the diagnosis, then the outcome is not good. So my, I will spend one minute on this slide. And if, if you are sleeping, if you are eating, if you are having a dinner, watching a TV, stop that for one minute and concentrate on this. And you will thank me if you, when you diagnose or not miss a next biliary atresia. So please, please, and please, suspect every child with conjugated jaundice who has got pale stool has biliary atresia unless proven otherwise. If you do an ultrasound, you may be lucky. They find absent abnormal gallbladder, triangular cord sign, asplenia, polysplenia, situs inversus. If one of these things are there, that thickens the plot. Do a liver biopsy if possible and safe. Don't put child at risk. If there is no surgical backup in your hospital, don't do a liver biopsy. If there is a surgical backup, please do, because you may be unlucky to have one bleed after the biopsy. Do not, do not, do not waste your time on HIDA scan. Because if stools are pigmented, your HIDA scan will excrete. If stools are pale, it will not excrete. But what you will do is you will waste about week to 10 days or maybe long, depending on where you work or practice. So HIDA scan is very fancy test. It's seen as nuclear medical scan. It does not add value, it delays. Very rarely we do HIDA scan. I can discuss that in question and answer session because never say 100% in medicine. HIDA scan is, is, is value, but extremely, extremely uncommon. We do ERCP in select cases where liver biopsy is inconclusive, stool color is sometimes variable, hence we do ERCP. Finally, the diagnosis of biliary atresia is only made on exploratory laparotomy. And if that is the case, then the surgeon should be prepared to do portraentrostomy. Don't open a child just to make a diagnosis. If the surgeon is not capable of doing portraentrostomy, then don't open the child. Do not waste time by unnecessary investigations. And if you have a child with persistingly pale stools, speak to somebody who has done surgery on biliary atresia, the surgical team, ask their advice and go with that. Sitting on a child because they could be deceiving. The child, those children look well. As I said before, their bilirubin may be going down while your investigation don't get assured, false assured that bilirubin is going down, so it's not biliary atresia. It can happen. So with that background, I will move to Kasai's operation. So Mar the Sorai have already showed you a picture of Dr. Mario Kasai and surgery for uncorrectable, more than 80% type of biliary atresia that she brought in, and he changed the game for this condition. He came from his north town of Sendai, that's where he practiced. And this is, was his first description, surgical description of the size operation. 
And this is again a, a biliary tree, which I showed you earlier on. And this is what the liver looks like. So the surgery is, is quite, it's, it's not minimal surgery. The liver has mobilized, if you see. The liver has come out, in other words, mobilized, and the surgery is done in a mobilized liver. If the technique, this technique is not done, then the outcome of surgery is not good because you know, an osteomotic, an osteomosis is not good. So our surgeons, when we have oh, historically, Ted Howard and then Mark Davenport, our outcomes are very good. And we think this is related to mobilization of the liver technique. Now, if you get a successful porterontrostomy, they look like this, they are pink standing, while if they are unsuccessful, they are yellow, distended abdominal veins, very thin arms, very poor muscle mass, and that is what you get by not doing a timely operation for biliary atresia. So those who clear their jaundice, they have a long-term survival versus those who don't clear their jaundice. So within the three to six months after operation, we say six months for success of Kasai, bilirubin should be normal. That means 20 micromoles or lower. If that hasn't been achieved, then we predict a good long-term survival. But if the jaundice has not been cleared by six months, it's invariably they will need a transplant in the first few years of life. Now I want to go to the third group of conditions, which we call progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis. And progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis has become an entity, has been more recognized since we started doing molecular genetics for children with cholestasis. And that's where I like to pay tribute to my mentor, Alex Movet, because he in his 80s described a condition with low gamma GT cholestasis, and he said they were poor prognosis. And most of these patients came from Middle East, Qatar, sorry, from Kuwait and from Saudi. Those were the most common countries that we got the patient with low gamma GT cholestasis. And those patients, when subsequently were analyzed and had a mutational analysis done, that's where we described the condition of bile salt export pump by my colleague, Professor Richard Thompson. And since then, several other uh, genetic mutational conditions has been described by us and others. So Ra mentioned a name Allergyl syndrome, uh, named after Daniel Allergyl, who was at Bisset Hospital at, in Paris. So these children tend to have a characteristic faces. Uh, this is the paucity of intrahepatic bile ducts. If you do a bio, liver biopsy, what you find in this uh, portal tract is there are no bile ducts. There is a portal vein and there is an artery. There is no duct here. Then they tend to have eye changes, which are, uh, we, we have to call them changes in the retina, changes at the level of cornea. So these are the specific changes for uh, eye examination called posterior embotroxone. If your ophthalmologist has seen few, he, he will be able to help you with that. Invariably, you have cardiac anomalies, and most common one is peripheral pulmonic stenosis, but it could be any cardiac abnormality. And then they have this butterfly vertebrae, where there is a posterior arch of vertebras don't meet, and they look like wings of uh, a butterfly. Now, before I go into genetic cholestatic syndromes, I want to give you a very simple overview of pathophysiology of bile transport or physiology of bile transport. So there is a hepatocytes and there is a canaliculus. So what happens is between these two, there are junctional complexes. So the things don't leak. So in the canalicular membrane, we get the transport of the bile. And if you expand it further, what you find is in these hepatocytes, the bile will flow in here and then the cholangiocytes. But it's not a passive process. It's an active energy consuming process. And it's mediated by the transporters. And these transporters are MDR2, MDR3, MDR3 in humans, MDR2 in animal model. And then there are these FIC1, which we'll talk a little bit about, bile salt export pump, MRP2, which takes the bilirubin in. And if you go into the cholangiocyte, what you find is CFTR, neonatal sclerosing cholangitis, and cholangiopathies or ciliopathies, which I will briefly describe later on. So CFTR cystic fibrosis defect also likes in the cholangiocyte to cause liver disease. And that's the bile flow. How does the bile flow? So the portal venous blood enters the liver sinusoids, parenchyma from this portal vein, and it comes back when it goes into the membrane of these are the cholangiocytes and the bile 
So there is a counter current flow, the blood flowing this side, while the bile is flowing towards this side, which is the bile duct. Now, if you expand it, so if you look at what does the canaliculus look like if you put it under a, a big microscope, and that's what it looks like. Okay. So what it does is it shows you there's an MRT, which is take the bilirubin in, then there's a bile salt export pump that takes the bile acids in, and this FIC1 disease, which is basically a, a phospholipid disorder rather than a bile acid disorder. Similarly, MDR3 deficiency is also a phosphatidylcholine defect. And what it does is the membrane, which is coating the biliary canaliculus, phosphatidylcholine is missing, and the bile that is brought in by the bile salt export pump, the bile acids will damage the bile duct tube. So this is a hepatocyte on the left, canaliculus on the right. MRP2 means conjugated bilirubin goes in. Bile salt export pump will take the bile acids in, and the mixed missiles are formed in the intestine, and they are absorbed into the portal circulation. As you know, most of our bile acids in the terminal ileum comes back to the liver because body needs bile acids to promote the bile flow. Phosphatidylcholine is a defect in MDR3 because MDR3, if the phosphatidylcholine is missing, then this bile, salt, bile that has come will damage your membrane. And this FIC1 again is a, again, as I said, it's a phosphatidylcholine defect. Previously, we used to talk low gamma GT cholestasis and high gamma GT cholestasis. But what is becoming clearer now is that is with faint. There is no 100% that all BSCP has low gamma GT. There's no 100% that all MDR3 have high gamma GT. So the diagnosis is more now mutational rather than based on the biochemistry. You can suspect it, but it's not always proven. So in low gamma GT, particularly, we worry about primary or secondary bile acid synthesis defects. And the main reason for saying that is it's a treatable condition. If you find a primary bile acid synthesis defect, there is a medication these days and that can avoid a chronic liver disease and uh, life-threatening end-stage liver disease and transplantation. Then in the group of progressive family intrahepatic cholestasis, we have bile salt export pump, FIC1 disease, and there are one third of them with low gamma GT, we still do not have a gene or identified mutation for them. So remember here, just having a low gamma GT doesn't give you a diagnosis, it puts you into a direction of these conditions. And even in then, 30% of your patients, if you send them to us, they may go back to you with no diagnosis yet. We may call them low gamma GT cholestasis, but that's not a diagnosis. What it means is we haven't found a mutational diagnosis yet. So just a little bit about uh, uh, BSCP deficiency. It's encoded by ABCB11 uh, cassette. It's a major bile acid trans transport, as I explained to you. The spectrum of the disease is low gamma GT cholestasis, means if you do AST, ALT, gamma GT, you find AST and ALT are high. Patient is jaundiced, but gamma GT is 20, 30, 25, like that. Usually present from the neonatal onset, first form in the first few month, weeks or months of life. There is a B444A mutation, which is late onset disease, a heterozygous condition described, uh, but not in young children. Interestingly, they don't have outside liver disease, any other organs. That this condition does not affect other organs. It, one third of these patients have gallstones though. This is interesting observation we had that some of our patients develop this lesion. And this is quite worrying. This is a cancer. Liver cancer in children is exceedingly, exceedingly rare, but in some of these conditions predispose these children to liver cancer. And what we also found is, uh, it does occur in other chronic liver disease, but in particularly in BSCP deficiency, risk is higher. There are certain genotypes that have a higher risk. And those are the ones which are truncated mutations. And here, if you have more than one missense mutation, there's a 10% risk. If you have two protein truncating mutations, there is a 38% chance of malignancy and 15% are alive with own liver. So it is a quite a worrying condition and we have to monitor these children Particularly, if you have these patients in your follow-up, we need to keep it in mind that they can develop cancer. FIC1 disease is encoded by ATP8B1, cassette of genes. Uh, spectrum of disease is not just only low gamma GT cholestasis, but they have a quite severe malabsorption. They tend to have very, they're small babies. I call them bonsai children. They're small, they're very growth stunted. 
deafness, there are defects in their, meta, in their metacarpals, uh, and there are other, increasingly, other syndromes are also described. Two minutes more we have. Okay, so raised gamma GT cholestasis, we have cholangitis, cholangiopathy, but what I want to bring to your attention is MDR3 deficiency, which we do see children coming from Middle Eastern part, and their symptoms are usually itching and uh, uh, liver disease, but they're not very jaundiced. Neonatal sclerosis and cholangitis, when you have differential diagnosis of biliary atresia, you don't find biliary atresia, but you find patency of the ducts is a neonatal sclerosing cholangitis. Our group described a mutation for this condition, DCDC2, and which is, means that it's a genetic condition different from biliary atresia. That's the condition that we described. Briefly, what can be done? You can do a biliary drainage or external biliary drainage for these patients. And these are the mixed data. So it works not, doesn't work for everybody. It works for many. So in a select group of patients with BSCP, we will offer in other patients, it doesn't work very well. And there are certain mutations, it works well, not always. Hence, having a mutation analysis is important. What we are going to have new is new drugs that interfere with bile, biliary absorption, bile acid absorption in the terminal ileum. And these are the very exciting drugs that are showing that compared to placebo, there is a sustained decrease in serum bile acid levels. And if you find bile acid levels below 100, then you improve your survival, which is liver transplant free, and you find a significant improvement in the itching. So these drugs are extremely interesting, and they're helping these children when they have particular itching. So 20 seconds on general management, then most of them will read MCT rich formulae, vitamin K supplement, vitamin supplement, or so in a select group of patients, various varieties of antipruritic agents, biliary diversion, and ultimately transplantation in some. And I thank you very much for watching. Keep watching for new etiologies all the time because children are not small adults and they could be quite a uh, handful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Dawan, for the excellent presentation. Really, we wanted to listen to this time factor is there. Thank you very much. Now I would like to request uh, Dr. Dalia to start her presentation. Then we'll have a panel. Thank you very much, Professor Dawan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so a uh, fantastic talk. Hopefully this time it will work. Uh, let me go. Um, here. And then, as Dr. Taufik say, duplicate slideshow. Is it better now? Share the screen first, Doctor. Yeah, is this better now? No, share your screen. You're not shared your screen still. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's good. Dr. Uh, yeah. Green one, green one in the bottom, green one share the screen. And now... Okay, I'll continue. Continue. No need to enlarge it. You continue. No, no, it's okay. Continue in the same. Yeah, one second. Because we figured it out. Um, so okay. Let's put it down. Okay, it's okay. On the same slide, you continue, Dr. Dalia. Yeah. Okay. Is it better now? Yes. Cool. Okay. cool, finally. <laughs> right, so uh, let's start with our first case. Uh, and this is a heavy duty after fantastic talk from Dr. Uh, Anil Dawan. So um, the first uh, case is a GI case, so a bit of change of topic. Uh, this is a two-year-old toddler who uh, presented with tiredness and reduced oral intake. 
and she was a bit constipated. Uh, she had a background history of excessive milk intake and more than 50% of her calorie intake was from cow's milk. Her other uh, diet was pasta and small amount of red meat and fruits. Uh, there's a strong family history of atopy in which dad has asthma and uh, mom had uh, eczemas and hay fevers. On examination, the child looked uh, extremely pale. She was a little bit puffy uh, with mild periorbital edema and lower limb edema as well. Her growth was fine following the 9th to 25th centile for height and weight. So uh, looking into her labs, uh, she was quite anemic at expected, uh, her hemoglobin was 5.6, uh, her white cell count was fine, uh, apart from si slightly raised eosinophils. Uh, interestingly, her albumin was low at 2.7 milligram per deciliter. Uh, she has a normal liver enzymes and clotting uh, with normal CRP, but slightly raised ESR, which could be related to her uh, anemia. So now we have a child who had a low albumin count as well as um, low uh, as well as anemia. Uh, so what further tests uh, you would consider to do? Uh, obviously, we need to uh, look into the causes of low albumin. Is there any um, liver diseases? Her liver function is normal. Uh, is there any um, losses from the uh, urine or is there any GI losses? Uh, so we've done uh, the urine and the protein to creatine ratio and that was normal. Uh, her celiac serology, obviously it's a common cause of malabsorption in this age group, came back as normal with normal IG IgA level and normal IgA tissue transglutaminase. Uh, her fecal calprotectin was slightly raised and her fecal elastase was low. Uh, one of the good tests to look for uh, protein loss in the GI tract is the fecal alpha-1 antitrypsin. And that came back as five times the upper limit of normal. Uh, we checked her fecal GI pathogens and in the PCR panel to look into uh, any infections such as Giardia that can cause malabsorption and enteropathy and that came back as normal. So we have a child who is losing protein through the gut with some evidence of uh, raised inflammatory markers. So uh, to look for causes, uh, we did an abdominal ultrasound, which was normal, and we did an echo because one of our differential is intestinal lymphangiectasia, and we wanted to make sure that the heart structure and the lymphatic drainage is normal. So in order to get into the diagnosis and to see what, the, what is the cause of the enteropathy, we did an endoscopic assessment. And in doing endoscopy, I found that the stomach and the duodenum was quite inflamed. Um, there was under histology, there was an um, infiltration of the eosinophils into the mucosa with more than 60 eosinophils per the hyper field, um, eosinophilic reptitis, and infiltration of eosinophils into the submucosa. Her terminal allium and colonic biopsy was within normal, apart from slightly raised um, eosinophils in the mucosal surface. So we made the diagnosis of protein losing enteropathy, secondary to eosinophilic gastritis and enteritis. And as treatment, we started uh, initially with the food exclusions and as a toddler, it was really hard really to convince her to drink the amino acid formula. So we had to mix it with the oat milk and we continued on the six food elimination diet. Um, she, uh, her, her diet was mainly hypoallergenic based on potato, rice and greens, in addition to more than 50% of her calorie based on amino acid formula. Uh, thankfully, uh, she responded really well and at three months of follow-up, she has normalization of all of her uh, value, including her stool sample, as well as uh, improvement of her anemia and albumin count. Her rest was positive for cow's milk and egg. And we continue her on dairy and egg-free diet with good uh, clinical remission. So just a little bit of a recap on eosinophilic gut disease. Uh, it, is infiltration of eosinophils into the GI tract, and it can affect any part of the GI tract, starting from the um, esophagus and down to the colon. The most common one is eosinophilic esophagitis. The involvement of the disease can be a simple mucosal, but it can be submucosal and serosal at times. And similar to the inflammatory bowel disease, it has a pathway of a flare and remission course. Um, you can find eosinophilia in 50% of the cases with eosinophilic gut disease. 
uh, management of these depending on the severity of symptoms. So in um, eosinophilic esophagitis, most of the time patients respond to food exclusion and topical therapy of steroids such as viscous budenicide. When it is quite extensive and not responding to food exclusion, we consider systemic steroid and immunomodulator and even at times biologic. And these are mainly in children with submucosal and serosal inflammation. So uh, for this case, take home message that iron deficiency might not only be um, in toddlers secondary to over intake of cow's milk, think of uh, protein losing enteropathies in children with low albumin and anemia. Uh, differential diagnosis, keep in mind celiac disease, eosinophilic gut disease, very early onset IBD and intestinal lymphangiectasia. So um, the second case is a bit of difference. So it's more um, a hepatology case. And so this is an eight year old a female who uh, had the background of being an ex premature 27 weeker. And uh, she has an eventful um, course of uh, her stay with no complication of prematurities. She presented at eight years of age with being a bit tired and dull abdominal pain. Uh, her pediatrician done all the right tests, including the thyroid, renal, liver, celiac, and all came back fine, apart from mild thrombocytopenia and lymphopenia. So in view of the persistent lymphopenia and thrombocytopenia, she was referred to the infectious disease doctor who uh, did all the right tests, including immune function test and HIV testing, uh, blood film, LDH, and everything was normal. Uh, she had an abdominal ultrasound, uh, which showed that the spleen is slightly at the upper limit of normal, but nothing else. And uh, she was just continued and monitored. Interestingly, four months later after that, she presented to the emergency department with lightheadedness, followed by a collapse. And her hemoglobin found to be 5.7, and it was 11 uh, before that. So that's a significant drop of hemoglobin. And on taking further history, um, it was um, the parents informed us that she was passing some black stool, a large amount of black stool. So we have a child who was ex premature, who probably had an umbilical vein catheters done in her prematurity. Uh, she has some hypersplenisms with lymphopenia and thrombocytopenia, and a bit of splenomegaly, who presented with what looks like a GI bleeding. So um, I think the clever uh, ER doctor requested one test, which gave to the, the which gave us the diagnosis, and that was. targeted abdominal ultrasound with Doppler. And this showed an obstruction into the portal vein and the formation of collateral around the portal vein leading to portal hypertension and variceal bleeding. And this is something we quite see quite frequently in the liver center as a portal vein obstruction is one of the major cause of GI bleeding in children with variceal causes. So as management for variceal bleeding, uh, the patient had blood transfusion, uh, proton pump inhibitor, and IV octreotide, which is a strengthening uh, basal constrictor. And then the child underwent an endoscopic assessment, which showed grade three varices and red cherry spots that was banded successfully. So as you can see from my uh, slide, uh, this is the bander, and you're looking through the endoscope uh, and to the uh, varices. This is the elastic band, and this is the uh, engorged vessels that has been banded in order to cut the blood supply and stop the bleeding. The child underwent multiple uh, banding session and after that uh, she went and had the definitive therapy which is the Rex shunt. So uh, the Rex shunt is quite a corrective uh, surgery because you are bypassing the portal vein obstruction. So this is the portal vein and this is the obstructed area and you bypass it from, uh, by using an internal jugular vein graft uh, into the Rex branch from the left portal vein into the portal, uh, into the portal vein or the mesenteric vein. And uh, thankfully the patient responded really well and six months post-discharge her platelet and lymphocyte count were improving. 
So just a bit of recap on portal hypertension. As we know, it's increasing the blood pressure within the portal circulation, and you have an increased pressure between the uh, portal vein uh, and the uh, hepatic vein. Uh, causes can be a hepatic as in liver cirrhosis, and, uh, or it could be extra hepatic as in portal vein obstruction. Uh, one of the main causes of, uh, or association with portal vein obstruction is umbilical vein catheterization, as well as uh, other congenital anomalies uh, such as uh, heart diseases and renal diseases. So in portal hypertension, you can get collaterals mainly around the esophageal uh, veins and around the uh, rectal veins and around the falciform uh, ligament leading to uh, the capomodus appearance. Uh, the main presentation of portal hypertension, which is uh, quite obviously um, uh, important is the hypersplenism and the splenomegaly, and this is because of the back flow of the portal uh, circulation into the spleen, as well as the similar pathology, the back flow into the small bowel leading to mucosal edema, um, malabsorption and faltering growth, and uh, the most uh, um, cause of mortality and morbidity is the variceal bleeding. And as you can see from the slide, this is a massive uh, GI bleed from a varices, and there's someone trying just to uh, inject um, some, um, injecting some secular therapy to stop the bleed. Uh, but it is a major cause of morbidity and mortality in children with uh, portal hypertension. So if you have a portal vein obstruction, the management is um, the corrective one is the Rex shunt, as we explained. And um, if this is not achievable because you don't have the Rex um, vein developed, um, then uh, you can uh, have another type of shunts, uh, may have another type of shunts, such as the mesocaval shunt or the splenorenal uh, shunt. But uh, they are not as corrective as the Rex shunt because you are mixing the portal circulation into the systemic circulation. If you have an established liver disease and you developed a GI bleed from portal hypertension, secondary to stiff liver, uh, then obviously a, a shunting, external shunt will not help and you need to have a, an internal shunt, what they call it TIPS. Uh, so this is a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. Um, and this is usually done by the interventional radiology. And in children, if you need really tips because of GI bleeding and portal hypertension, this is usually a bridge uh, to, till you get uh, the liver transplant, which is the correction. So uh, take home messages to uh, pediatrics. Uh, think of portal vein obstruction and cavernoma formation in children who are clinically well with splenomegaly and presenting with GI bleeding. And actually one of the common causes when someone called me for GI bleed, the first question I ask, what is the platelet? What is the lymphocytes? Because I want to make sure is there uh, hypersplenism and splenomegaly. Uh, in children who had uh, splenomegaly and hypersplenism, think of asking specifically, is there portal vein obstruction? And make sure you do the Doppler study in addition to the abdominal ultrasound to look into the portal vein flow. And definitely in neonatal unit, ensure proper positioning of the umbilical catheter because malpositioning of the UVC into the portal tract might not cause a problem to the child, uh, to the babies, but later on in life, he might have encountered problem with portal vein obstruction. So that's the second case, and we'll move to the third one. And so um, back to gastroenterology. Uh, this is a 14-year-old female uh, who presented with a gradual reduction in weight. Uh, she had no GI symptoms at all, but uh, she just reports to have nausea and a poor appetite. Uh, she's seen by many doctors, and she was prescribed iron and multivitamin supplement, and she was treated for helicobacter pylori. Her initial blood test shows slightly mi uh, mild anemia and slightly raised ESR. Uh, her family referred her to the psychologist because of uh, the low mood. Interestingly, her mom has Crohn's disease, and uh, she has surgical resection of her bowel um, recently. When she presented to me, she was unable to walk and she has significant weight loss. On examination, she looks very emaciated with a BMI of 13. She was pale and unlike eating disorder, she was quite tachycardic with cold peripheries. 
So on examination, um, she had a typical inflammatory mouth ulcers that we see endoscopically with Crohn's and, and that's something to look for in her upper gum. And so this is the exudate surrounded by area of uh, redness and erythema and um, edema. As well on abdominal examination, uh, it felt like she had a bulge in her right lower quadrant. Uh, her perianal area showed a typical inflammatory skin tags, uh, mainly at three o'clock from the anal verge. Uh, so this is quite uh, raw and inflamed and not like the usual skin tags you get from constipation, which is usually at six o'clock and 12 o'clock. Her lower limb examination uh, revealed that some erythema and tracking on her upper thigh. So we've done her labs and she is quite anemic, neutrophilia, CRP of 180, um, thrombocytosis and ESR of 95. Uh, she had a CT abdomen with contrast, which showed multiloculated fluid collection in the right iliopsoas area and the right uh, and the lateral abdominal wall, extended distally to the proximal femur. And her terminal allium showed a circumferential wall thickening with localized abscess formation, raising suspicion of a sealed perforation. So this is the um, CT scan of my poor patient, and this is the um, thickening of her terminal allium and the tracking causing the um, lateral wall abscess. Uh, and this is another image. If you can see, uh, this is a normal psoas um, muscle and look this into this psoas muscle full of abscess. And this is the lateral wall abscess and the tracking into the upper thigh. So I was feeling the bulge here and I was uh, looking into the uh, redness in her right thigh. So uh, quite extensive disease and she underwent uh, two uh, CT guided drainage for the abscesses. Uh, she had IV antibiotics and bowel rest with parental nutrition for four weeks. Uh, thankfully, she responded well and she had her definitive surgery, which was a right hemicolectomy. And interestingly, this is what was uh, the mom um, area of disease as well. And she did have a right hemicolectomy as well. Uh, the child did really well on immunomodulator and biologic therapy. So uh, a little bit of iliopsoas abscess, and um, it can be the initial presentation uh, of Crohn's disease, uh, limping and fever, one of the uh, main uh, symptoms of iliopsoas abscess. Other differential diagnoses can be considered like the tuberculosis or the salmonella with the GI perforation, sealed perforation and a staph sepsis from trauma. So take home message from this case, uh, suspect the Crohn's disease in patients with unexplained weight loss, even if no reported GI symptoms. And keep in mind that small bowel Crohn's doesn't usually present with, uh, with, with urgency, blood and, and diarrhea all the time. And as well, it's important to look for GI clues, such as in the oral cavity, the external anal examination, and the careful examination of the right lower quadrant, as this where you can feel the tenderness and the fullness. And the fourth case, and the last case, is a 14-year-old female um, who had recurrent presentation to uh, the ER department with uh, generalized abdominal pain, constipation, and nausea, and vomiting as well. She had a normal blood test. She had an abdominal x-ray, which revealed fecal loading, and she's been kept treated as constipation. Um, after a few presentation to ER, it was noticed that her weight was dropping and her BMI dropped from 19 to 17. She was referred to me and we have done an upper giant endoscopy and colonoscopy. Uh, the endoscopy showed a really elongated stomach and really, um, a really dilated uh, duodenum, uh, mainly in the duodenal bulb. And I saw the bile uh, refluxing back from the duodenum into the stomach. So uh, to look for any anatomical abnormality, we've done an upper GI contrast. And as you can see, a large stomach, uh, there's no malrotation because the duodenum bypassed the midline, uh, but we can see that the duodenum is quite dilated and concerns about some uh, further obstruction. Uh, we had raised the suspicion of superior mesenteric artery syndrome, and hence we've done a CT angio. 
And as you can see from this image, uh, so this is the abdominal aorta, this is the vertebra, this is the abdominal aorta, and this is the superior mesenteric artery. And in between the superior mesenteric artery and the aorta, this is the duodenum that has been obstructed. The reason for that happening is because of the weight loss and the, the loss of the retroperitoneal fat. You can see here as well in the um, coronal view. So this is the aorta and this is the superior mesenteric artery and the duodenum being compressed between these two vessels. So initially, we tried to uh, manage her with nasogastric feed and nasogenal feeding, hoping that once she regained her weight, that the retropectoneal fat will improve and uh, she will have resolution of her symptoms. Initially, she tolerated it well um, with a gain of two kilo, but, and then she was discharged. But unfortunately, she kept vomiting her NJ tube and uh, with the difficult reinsertion of the NJ tube, uh, she kept uh, losing weight and uh, her um, her symptoms became more prominent uh, because of reduction of the retroperitoneal fat and uh, the aorta mesenteric angle become sharper and sharper. So uh, for her, it was around 13 degree. Uh, so uh, three months down the line, when she's in Manchester, everyone knows about my patient. She is on cocktail of medication, laxative, hyacinth batches, uh, gabapentin, opiate, lidocaine, cyclizine, on ondansterone because of pain and nausea. So um, she had a multidisciplinary team meeting and the plan was to go ahead with total parental nutrition for eight weeks to receive store her weight and then uh, take her to the definitive surgery. So she managed to gain five kilogram and uh, then she had the definitive surgery, which was the jejunostomy. And uh, as you can see from here, uh, so this is the mesenteric um, artery pressing on the duodenum and the surgery is to attach the duodenum into the uh, jejunum and that help with the flow of uh, meals and, and, and um, food into her. Uh, thankfully, she tolerated the procedure well and with time uh, she started regaining her weight and uh, she's been off the medication. So a little bit about uh, superior mesenteric artery syndrome. Uh, it is quite under-recognized and uh, there are milder form and there are severe form. And in some of the literature, it's report an incidence of one in 300. It's mainly suspected in thin young females. Uh, lots of these females have been diagnosed as eating disorder, not otherwise specified, and uh, as well as the female with scoliosis and scoliosis repair. Uh, and this is because of the change of the uh, stomach axis and uh, its effect on the duodenum and the SMA. So it is a compression of the duodenum between the abdominal aorta and the superior mesenteric artery. And as we said, it is usually related to the loss of the retroperitoneal and the mesenteric fats. Uh, the severe form is the one that presents with severe vomiting and it usually needs surgery or significant intervention. And this is when your angle is less than 15 degree. Uh, the normal angle of the SMA to the aorta should be between 38 and 56. But the milder form is anything less than 25 degree, you can have some milder form of SMA syndrome. Uh, so the milder version usually misdiagnosed as functional dyspepsia or eating disorder, not otherwise specified. And as we said, the severe form is the one that presents with vomiting and um, bile vomits or partial undigested food. The problem with the SMA syndrome, it is a circle in which you're feeling nauseous and uh, hence you don't eat, you lose weight, you lose weight, you lose your retroperitoneal fat, you have worsening of your SMA angle and that leads to uh, further nausea. The important thing is to try to cut this circle by nutrition. Uh, the conservative management usually work in milder version and usually as a gastroenterologist, you. Uh, you, uh, you advise the small feed or liquid diet, as well as high calorie nutritional supplements. And the aim is to restore weight. Uh, and the prognosis can be excellent if this has if this managed appropriately. So take home message, think of mild form of SMA syndrome in thin teenager girl with nausea. 
Uh, endoscopy and barium might only show some biliary reflux and delay gastric emptying. Encouraging nutrition and weight restoration uh, can uh, solve the problem. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dalia, for nice presentation and finishing in time. Uh, yeah. Would you before, please before. stop sharing? Now, before uh, starting the question and answer, uh, there will be a short video. Uh, and after that, I will request uh, Dr. Kalpana and Dr. Diari to start the questions. So we will have a very short, uh, brief video, two minutes, two, three minutes. Then we'll start question and answer. I would like to request all the viewers, whatever question you want to ask, put it in the question and answer box. Our expert, Professor Davan and uh, Dr. Dalia, along with our moderators, they will discuss it. Thank you. Over to Tofin. can be easily dissolved in a cup of water or in a baby feeding bottle. In general, dissolve the content of one sachet into a 200 ml of water. Now stir well until it is fully dissolved and take it. The taste is great thanks to the pleasant taste of raspberry the children love. According to the doctor's instruction, you can take just one powder of the double chamber sachet. You can keep one of the two rooms of the sachet closed with the fingers while emptying the other. The sachet room with the colored powder contains the electrolyte mix. As you can see, that one. In this case, I'm keeping close the electrolyte part of the sachet. As you can see, the color of the water is white because there is just the probiotic part of the formulation. until the safety tap breaks.
When you hear the soft grab, means that the lid of the deposit is pierced and the product goes into the juice within the bottle. Then continue to turn the cap clockwise as far as possible. Okay. Now shake the bottle well until the powder is completely dissolved. Great. Turn the cap counterclockwise and consume the content of the bottle. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, uh, now I would like to request uh, Professor Dovan, Dr. Dahlia, Dr. Kalpana, and Dr. Diari to join us and start the question and answer. Dr. Kalpana, Dr. Diari, please. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Dawan and Dr. Dalia. Thank you very much to, for being on time and for this excellent presentation. There are a lot of uh, questions, and um, we will start with uh, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Miqdadi, which is asking Professor Anil regarding the, again, to stress on the importance of uh, checking direct bilirubin, hyperbilirubinemia as a direct uh, or as the presentation and early referral. And his next question is about vaccination, COVID vaccine in transplanted patients or liver transplant patients. So, uh, uh, Mohammed, thank you very much for asking this question. And I'm very grateful because our audience is general pediatrics, neonatologists, gastroenterologists. Uh, it is not uncommon, even in the UK or anywhere, where jaundice in newborn is seen as breast milk jaundice. And they are left to, most of them will be breast milk jaundice, but the unlucky ones you are looking after may have a biliary atresia. So please, when you order a bilirubin, order a split bilirubin as well, or direct bilirubin, because that will change your management further on. If you get a total of 200 and get a 25, 50 of conjugated, that is a warning sign that you are dealing with liver disease, not breast milk jaundice. So my request is, Mohammed, thank you again. Please do check split bilirubin as and when you request total bilirubin. After two weeks, at least. If you can do early, great, if minimum two weeks. The second question about transplantation and COVID, the problem at the moment with all the vaccine is none of them are tested before 16 years. So they are not licensed. So we can't give them. So I think with time, if there's more data emerges, then this population will be offered. Currently, we are offering it after more than 16 years of age group who are transplant children. Thank you, Dr. Davin. You have already answered uh, another question. Uh, from Dr. Ram Babu. Now moving on to uh, Dr. Samarji's question about when do you decide to do genetic tests panel for transient neonatal cholestasis, especially to eliminate a PFIC? So there is a word transient PFIC. I wouldn't use that term. If you have a genetic condition, it's going to be there with you all your life. Transient means when you are seeing the child, it may be getting better, but you send him home three months later, six months later to come back. So word transient is not correct. When we have, in the first round, we try to exclude biliary atresia. And if it's not a biliary atresia, they will get a cholestasis gene panel, which is in the first few weeks of life. And the cholestasis gene panel, we test for 16 genes uh, that, can, that include all the common and the rare genetic disorders that we have so far described. Uh, okay, Dr. Anil, Dr. Ajmal Khan is also one of our uh, consultant uh, gastroenterologist. He's asking about uh, what's the prognosis of ABCB4 mutation in progressive familial uh, intrahepatic cholangiopathy type 3 generally. So Ajmal, hi, good to see, hear from you. Ajmal was with me long time back. So Ajmal, uh, the PFIC3 data is emerging. You are absolutely right. They are not very jaundiced. They present with like biliary disease, sclerosing cholangitis like or gallstones. And uh, the prognosis is they usually don't have a problem in the first 10, 15 years of life. Usually the problems are in when they're teenage. 
And that's when the problem is portal hypertension or intractable itching, one of the two. Or they come to a decompensated liver disease, like I recently had a patient from your part uh, who is 15 with encephalopathy and uh, MDR3 deficiency. So the mutational data at the moment is if you have a truncated mutation or two missense mutations, you are going to have a severe disease. But it's very difficult to predict because number of patients with the mutations identified and submutation analyses are so small, to, it's very difficult for us to generalize. But if you find a truncated mutation, we tell them that a prognosis is not good, but the transplantation is only offered when the symptoms management, not for just mutations. So mutations doesn't change the management, it may change our planning of management, but decision for transplantation will be only be taken on portal hypertension, synthetic failure, or intractable itching and poor quality of life. Right. I think Dr. Rajmal had another question regarding uh, allergy syndrome. How aggressively uh -huh. should you control hyperlipidemia? So, Ajmal, as you know, the hyperlipidemia in allergy syndrome is not like a hyperfamilial hypercholesterolemia. So the cholesterol lowering agents do not work and are not recommended either because they could be toxic. So this particular cholesterol or lipoprotein X does not cause cardiac injury. So it is not a cardiovascular risk. So just persistent hypercholesterolemia will not cause a cardiac death or anything complication of hyperlipidemia we see. They are cosmetic plus they are a discomfort if, they, if the hyperlipidemia appear on the dorsum of the hand or the sole or the ankles, because then it's very difficult for them to walk. There, I think if you can improve the biliary drainage, which you, with these drugs, as I mentioned in the last part of my slide called isb inhibitors, then there could be some reduction in cholesterol as well, or lipoprotein X, we call it. But otherwise, if they are really becoming a life interfering in nuisance, then liver transplantation is the only answer left then. And we have performed liver transplant because one child has two uh, golf ball size on his ankles and he couldn't put any shoes on and he couldn't walk. So that, that could become an indication for transplantation. Thank you. Dr. Anil, take two minutes rest. We will go to uh, Dr. Adalia. Dr. Adalia, as you present some surgical cases, now the superior mesenteric artery syndrome, we have a lot of cases and most of the time we are treating them conservatively as you just mentioned by nasogeugenal or by doggy style when after meals, when just to release the pressure on the duodenum. Uh, my surprise that they did for him duodenojejunostomy, although it is one option of the surgery. But uh, sometimes we can just increase the angle by also by surgery and to shift the duodenum to the right side of the abdomen without any anastomosis, because the anastomosis, there is also leak, there is a stenosis, there is so many complications of that. So what's your comment? Although this is a surgical part. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, like, yeah, we attempted a lot of um, conservative management, and uh, surprisingly, is even with the total parental nutrition, we managed, obviously, to increase the weight, um, but uh, this uh, family, I mean, the child kept complaining of problems. We kept putting her on left lateral with the feed, uh, but I think uh, the quality of life uh, being really affected, and, and the surgical um, the surgical option was made after MDT decision um, to go ahead with, and, and it's been like, in fifth, I think in the literature, 50% of the cases of SMA, the one with the severe um, uh, angles, with the one with less than 15 degree, uh, they do end up with surgery, and uh, it does work in, in some cases, but there's 50% complication, as you mentioned, the, um, once you, you affect the motility in this part of the gut, you do have this motility problems with bile leak and um, biliary reflux and all that. So uh, she was lucky that she responded well to the surgery, but I mean, yeah, after six months of inpatient in and out to stay, I think she probably, we can say fairly that she failed the medical management. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my next question regarding the patients with the Crohn's disease. Yeah. Although, again, this is a purely surgical, do you don't think that the right hemicolectomy was an aggressive surgery? Because this is a multifocal, and if you are going on and doing these surgeries and resections, then the patient will end with short bowel. Yeah. Actually, the right hemicolectomy was a big surgery done. Yeah. I think 
happened was you have a perforation and sealed perforation is better just to, res to resect it out. Um, so, I mean, definitely. But the, but the right hemicolectomy is a big surgery. Yeah. Now, there is from another question from our uh, senior radiologist regarding sphere mesenteric artery syndrome. Any role of uh, ultrasound? Um, uh, probably in a good hand, yes, in an experienced hand, definitely uh, ultrasound with Doppler and to see the SMA to the SMV, the position of SMA to the SMV. And we've done it actually a few times um, uh, with one of our experienced radiologists. They can tell you from the position if it is suspected um, SMA syndrome with a Doppler. Um, but I think the definitive one is, is the CT angio obviously gives you a very clear and beautiful images as you can see, yeah. And uh, maybe last question or uh, from Dr. Ajmal regarding the REC surgery. Yeah. He's uh, asking you, are you suggesting to go for early surgery? No, no, I think I think the, uh, the the Rex the Rex shunt is probably a curative shunt. Even especially if you are after a few banding session, you're still having problems. Your hypersplenism, your platelet is so low. I think the Rex shunt is a corrective surgery. It's only done in uh, by hepatobiliary surgeon. It shouldn't be done by any surgeon. Um, if it, you tell me uh, for the other shunts, I think I I would rather wait unless the child has severe GI bleed uncontrollable with banding. But definitely. Definitely the splenorenal and the uh, mesocaval shunt is, is just like um, an option to be considered if, if the patient has severe complication and if the child can be managed with propranolol and banding, it probably can be avoided, yeah. Any role of thrombolysis? Thrombolysis? Uh, not, no, it's because it's a long established, it's not an acute process. Maybe in neonatal period there is a role, but not uh, uh, when the thrombosis is well established. Thank you. Dr. Kalpana, please. Yes, a uh, couple of questions to Dr. Anil again. Uh, Dr. Shaista would like to know uh, whether MMV7 is used in the diagnosis of uh, uh, biliary atresia. Hi, Shaista, no. So it's, a nice... uh, it's a research parameter, one of the biomarkers. And uh, my advice, my request again and again is if the stools are not pigmented, do not waste time. Do not go around these fancy tests. They don't add value. They waste time and money. And you regret. That's only you do after a few weeks. When you have a child, then you refer the child for liver transplantation because you missed the boat for biliary atresia surgery. So all those things are, are, these are laboratory tests, which are for academia, for us to write papers, but not for clinical practice at this point in time. So while we are on the diagnosis, uh, uh, Professor uh, Davan, you mentioned uh, that you would elaborate on the role of HIDA scan. Yes. Uh, so in which conditions would you so really don't, do it? If you are suspecting biliary atresia, do not do the HIDA scan. It will, okay. co it will complicate your life. Very likely this will not excrete and you've already wasted two weeks, even if it's not biliary atresia. If child is cholestatic severely and child is the stools are not pigmented. It's a simple physics. It's not coming out. The bile is not flowing. Yeah. Okay. But if you show a pigment in the bile or in the if hide excretes, the reason I said very rare circumstances, if you have a very small preemie or a small baby in your neonatal unit where you are not sure of the stool color, it's up and down, then you can consider it because then you, if you show a excrete, excretion, then you exclude biliary atresia at that time. Okay, it's not, but it could progress. So HIDA scan has a, it's, it's an overrated investigation for biliary atresia. My advice would be stay away from it if you can. So uh, would it be safe to conclude and say that intraop cholangiogram and liver biopsy and or liver biopsy would give us a final answer? Intraoperative cholangiogram is the time when the diagnosis is made. So when we counsel our patients, when we say biopsy, we say it's 99% biliary atresia, but only the surgeon will tell you at the time of cholangiogram, they will do a paroperative cholangiogram and confirm the diagnosis. But liver biopsy, bid, pale stools, abnormal ultrasound, it's 100% biliary atresia. Uh, Dr. Anil, I have a couple of questions on biliary atresia. Actually, even the liver biopsy, sometimes I feel uh, it is now out of, they are not doing it too 
too many times. I mean, so it depends on the center where you are. Okay, it's, yeah. it's all your local confidence. What system have you created? If you have a biopsy, if in our center we do biopsy, we have a same date return. So if oh, you do right. a biopsy eight o'clock, yeah. nine, eleven o'clock, you get a result four o'clock. Okay, yeah. so same day return of the test. With the experience over years, we are not hundred percent either. So ninety-five percent chance. That's when we do ERCP. If the biliary, if there is a suspicion of biliary atresia, biopsy is not conclusive. Then we do an ERCP. Okay, now in, in our situation, ERCP is almost difficult in this age. We don't have the, the logistic of doing yeah. the ERCP in the neonates or in, in two months, three months. Now, my other question is regarding the incidence of biliary atresia in prim and preterm babies. Have you seen them? Because in yes. the last four years, we did two intraoperative cholangiogram and both of them were negative for biliary atresia and, biliary and, and, and preterm babies. So preterms is not an exclusion, but depend what time did you do it. It's about 10% of the population who had biliary atresia are preterm. That's about 10%. 10%. Yes, so this is not a small number. Usually they get delayed by the diagnosis when they come out on the unit, unit, etc. but it's not absent. Previously, it was thought that they don't have it. But the disease it. develops yeah. around 34, 32, 36 weeks time. But it could be a progression. So it wasn't there when they were in the neonatal unit. But as they come out, they could develop it as the time goes by. So there is not prematurity is not a protection against okay. biliary atresia. What's your protocol for steroids and antibiotic after biliary atresia repair? So steroids, if, if, if there is no CMB IgM or CMB DNA positivity in the child, then we give it for one month. Okay. And antibiotics, oral cephalosporin for one month. Okay. Okay. We are giving septrin actually. Uh, you can use septic, it's a local, as I said, you know, it's a local experience and everybody gets comfort with their experience. There is nothing, there's no right or wrong answer. It's a broad spectrum antibiotic. We use cephalosporins, you can use septic. So they're all biliary penetration is reasonably good of the both drugs. A question from our also uh, consultant pediatric gastroenterologist, Dr. Christos. He's talking about how much you expect the new IBAT inhibitors to change the natural course of progressive familiar intrahepatic cholangiopathy. So because of the absence of, at the moment, we don't have much. So anything that's showing a promise is very exciting, okay? I'm not as excited that it will change the field. I think it will give months, years, some response, but ultimately they will come to transplantation, but it could delay transplantation because obviously we are not affecting the natural history. To some extent we may, but mostly what we are doing is inhibiting the terminal absorption of the bile acids in this condition. So natural history will progress, but not at the same pace because the data is very limited. It's only two, three years follow-up. We have seen experience, but one of our child is coming for transplantation now who was on the trial. So that is, is becoming developing some HCC-like features in the liver. So as I said, natural history of the disease may not get changed that much, but symptom management is very good. The itching control we saw was very impressive, yes. And the diarrhea, as you mentioned in your question, Christos, thank you. Hi, Christos, again, uh, there is a increased incidence, but it's all symptom control. If the families and the parents are happy to continue, we will continue. Uh, but otherwise, if they say no, then we will stop it, yeah. But we didn't have any serious electrolyte abnormalities with the diarrhea. Right. So uh, for the benefit of the pediatricians, how late is too late, would you say? In how late diagnosis? is too late? I will say do as early as you can, uh, but in terms of patient's outcome, yes. so there are two, three, there are several variables then. It's not just simple age, okay? The reason we go on age is that that's one factor we can control, but there are individual factors that determine the outcome. So historically, the data goes up to eight weeks, okay? Then we found that we can stretch it up to 12 weeks, okay? But 12 weeks, that eight to 12 weeks group is very strange because that is not a unified group. Some of them are what we call late onset biliary atresia. So their outcome is slightly better. But if there are more than 100 days and they have complications of cirrhosis, then we don't open them up, then they don't get surgery done. 
So the decision to surgery is, is open till 12 weeks. But after that, it's individual surgeon and depending on if they have low albumin, if they have ascites, portal hypertension, then you don't touch them because they, they will accelerate. The disease will further go faster. So then we go for a primary transplantation. So the short answer to your question is, historically eight weeks, increasing data shows, can you go on up to 12 weeks? But we don't advertise it that much because people say, oh, we have 12 more weeks. We still say eight weeks is the best outcome. The, if you look at the best outcome, four or five weeks, the French data is better outcome. So at that age, if you do it five, six weeks of age, that's the bet, best outcome group you see. What you have to remember is it takes the center when you send a patient another week to investigate and plan the surgery. So it doesn't happen exactly. So you have to keep that one or two weeks in mind before you refer a patient to the next center. Yes. And uh, what would be the incidence of liver transplantation in those who were uh, actually put on the table early? Is, is it very low? So 60% of our patients who come to us clear their jaundice. That is called successful Kasai. Out of those, I think they will, majority of them will avoid transplant in the first five years. A small minority, 10-15% will develop, trans, get that transplants in the teenage years. Uh, and 30% are with their native liver at 20 years of age. So one third only. But those who don't clear their jaundice, they will get a transplant within two years. Okay. I think there are some questions now for Dr. Dalia. Uh, as regards your case of protein-losing enteropathy, how do you explain the presence of severe anemia in that? And also, uh, there was a question from Dr. Amra. What are the other six food eliminations in PLE other than egg and dairy that you mentioned? And so the six food elimination diet is a common term we use in gastroenterology. So that is cow's milk, soya, egg, wheat, um, seafood and nuts. Uh, so this the six food elimination diet because these are quite a uh, hyperallergenic food. Um, so, and uh, the first question is the anemia. So the anemia is the common presentation of malabsorption. And so iron deficiency anemia. And when you have uh, any type of enteropathy such as celiac disease, eosinophilic gut disease, Crohn's disease, uh, you do get malabsorption of micronutrients as well, including iron and vitamin D. So this is obviously the presentation, yeah. Right, and Dr. Rambabu would like to know, uh, what is the carcinogenic risk in eosinophilic gut disease? Uh, good question. Um, I don't think it is well established that you, the carcinogenic risk, definitely for eosinophilic esophagitis, and once you uh, develop uh, Barrett esophagus, uh, obviously that can uh, increase your risks and the fibrosis and any, any GI pathologies uh, that affect like achalasia, eosinophilic esophagitis, um, chronic gastritis, all of these increase your uh, cancer risk compared to the normal population with a healthy, with a healthy gut. So there is, there will be some, but um, uh, I don't think there's enough studies about the risk of carcinogenic risk and uh, eosinophilic gut disease. Right. Um... He also wanted to know whether umbilical vein catheterization can cause uh, portal hypertension eight years later. Yeah, yeah. Obviously it does. So we've done uh, a study in Leeds. Uh, I presented and there was a 55 cases of portal vein obstructions. Uh, the oldest uh, child we have was 16 years of age and presented at this, um, this, uh, this age as well. Yeah. Okay. So the portal, vein, the portal hypertension is already there, but the varices and the GI bleed obviously present later on in life, yeah. Yeah, there was another question regarding management, which I think you have covered uh, during your talk. Um, Dr. Diari. Uh, one, one question for uh, Professor Anil, uh, phenobarbitone post uh, Kasai procedure, are you giving? So historically we used to give because we didn't have many other drugs that time. It's a very good choleritic agent because it improves the cytochrome P450 enzyme. And historically, we did it for a long time that increasingly we are not doing it. Some patients get it, but they get, when they get side effects, sedation or the hyperactivity, we stop it. So we are the one of the oldest units left who still recommend phenobarbitone, but with ursodeoxycholic acid and clinical trials of the drugs coming, then we are not using it. But you may find some of our patients are still on phenobarbitone, maximum 45. The ones who are tolerating it, then we leave them on uh, but increasingly, it's not used. 
Okay, and in your center, uh, are you are doing laparoscopic or open cassette? It's, it's open at the moment. At the moment, it's open. Okay. The trouble is you only get one shot at this surgery if you can't go back again and do it. So uh, you can ask because laparoscopic surgery, you know, to do it, you need a good volume. And we only do about 25 to 30 a year. So we but don't do that many numbers. 25 to 30, yeah. Which is a very good number. It's, oh, it's, uh, a, it's a big number, but I, we don't think number. it's still a big number to let them do laparoscopically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, yeah. what about, uh, okay, if, uh, and because what, what we know, some, some centers, they are not doing because of the CO2 and the increase of the um, uh, acidosis, because it has been absorbed with the, through the peritoneum and it gives more acidosis and more liver damage or, yeah. So I don't know. So we have no much experience. Our only laparoscopic experience is colidocal cyst and uh, gallbladder. That, that is the only experience we have. Uh, but this young baby, is, we have no experience. So I will learn from you guys if you have done it. I know some people in South America started doing it, uh, but yes, I don't know the data. In, in UAE, yes, we have some centers they are doing. We are not doing, still we are doing it open. But some other centers doing laparoscopy. But I had no personal experience. No. Yeah, but the, but the numbers, they are really limited. Uh, three, four cases. They are limited. Yeah. And uh, Professor uh, Davan, you mentioned that uh, we should not uh, sit back when we get CMV hepatitis as the diagnosis. Yeah. There is, so I'm sure this is from your experience. So can you elaborate a bit? Yes. On so I have a cynical experience. I think CMB can cause everything except pregnancy. <laughs> and just like tuberculosis in India. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. CMB is such an ubiquitous virus. As you know, how many, 60, 70% of the UK yeah, population, and I'm sure 80, 90% of the Indian population, Indian subcontinent, I don't know the UAE data, but Indian subcontinent, 60 to 90% of the people are positive by the time they get to adulthood. So is it a real CMB disease? CMB disease is going to cause havoc. Once, it, once you have a CMB disease, you, as a neonatologist will tell us, they have full blown. So that's when we accept the diagnosis. We give them gancyclovir. These days, gancyclovir is given like Smarties without seeing the downside of the drug. When I hear, oh, somebody is on gancyclovir because they were CMB positive, but whether they have a primary CMB infection, Guthrie card, so what we do on our practice, when we get a CMB positive, we go back to the Guthrie card and we do a CMB DNA on the Guthrie card. If the Guthrie card, day four of life, is positive, then we say, well, it could be CMB. But we don't believe, we do not believe that CMB will cause chronic illness. So CMB can modify the problem of biliary atresia or other illnesses, but in itself, we don't believe it causes disease. So there is a CMB, we have a paper which describes CMB IgM positivity uh, that can, the group of people who didn't do well and had more inflammation on the biopsy. But if we see, when we see CMB hepatitis, like in post-transplant patients, or CMB syndrome, we see CMB, uh, um, what you call that, staining positive on the liver. That's when we call it CMB disease. Otherwise, we don't see a CMB staining in these people. So it's very, you know, woolly to call it CMB. So my request is, before we give them a diagnosis of CMB, make sure you have excluded treatable other conditions. You can call it okay. CMB. Once you have done all the workup and excluded other conditions, then you can call it CMB, yes. So what you're saying is don't just go by serology and label it as such. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Thank you, doctor. Um, uh, just uh, since we are in the COVID era, have you come across any uh, particular GI manifestations? Something away from your topic. Yes, question. so some of the children were sent for appendicectomy uh, with COVID yes. or acute. And then obviously some of them opened up initially, I'm talking of last year, April. Uh, then we learned that they didn't have, they, they had GI symptoms of COVID. And now we know we don't need to appendic do appendicectomy, but they need to be managed otherwise. So yes, but numbers are very, very small. So we have a lot of COVID. So in our hospital, we are a joint adult and pediatric hospital. Uh, very few. So we had maybe 10 or 12 in the whole season who presented with a syndrome. Uh, one died, but others have survived. And uh, so there were symptoms of liver disease, renal failure, 
they were kind of multi system you know sars like or systemic inflammatory response like symptoms uh, thrombosis okay. but uh, just pure gi yes you know when they have a gi abnormality they thought it was appendix initially but but now we know careful if you are going for appendix in covid era anybody is get everybody is getting a covid test before they enter the hospital so life is a bit easier now but i'm talking to you about the last years experience no mesenteric lymphadenitis like pictures that you've come across in the in the group that is so called syndrome of that they have everything they have some lymph nodes yeah, liver dysfunction yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, but that's just not... isolated now it will be difficult also to put everything to covid because positivity rate is so high in particular in children asymptomatic positivity is very high so for us to attribute every symptom of positive cm covid doesn't mean always they have a covid disease or just last week we have one baby 6 months with interception but it is not due to that one <laughs> so you must say yeah we have a lot of uh, appendixes which is perforated but nothing yeah. to do with covid yeah. just they came as a covid positive yeah sure right so there was an image that you showed and i almost thought that uh, you are showing torsion testes but it was no, ruptured that, that <laughs> diagnosis you can make of a perforated yeah. bile duct these yeah. are just so you know how often do you see that uh, this was only sure. i've seen only yeah. two this was the most remarkable so if you took a picture Uh, but the other one was not as expensive that only other one only showed some uh, you know that uh, cullen sign we see around the umbilicus yes, the umbilicus that is was yeah but, but the, that was high the scan was done for that yes. patient high the scan that's that's where you do high the scan so that's that's we, we have a typical <laughs> patient like that high the scan for a perforated uh, idiopathic cholidogal yeah. uh, common bile duct perforation and it is makes a nice slide to show to yes. people yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> had its visual impact it's a uh, teaching experience and, here rather than patient patient didn't get benefit of the idas can we knew already yes, what he yes, had yes. sure sure and uh, similarly dr dalia your fourth case of sma uh, um, uh, i'm sure it's a rare one or do you think it is uh, i was wondering when you said loss of weight and with this adolescence with eating disorders any relationship any you yes. know we should I think the severe form is the one with a degree less than fifteen. It's quite rare. Yes, you're absolutely right. You do one in ten thousand. Um, but there is what we call the milder form, the one where the degree is between fifteen and twenty-five, and it can present with symptoms and and epigastric pain and and delayed gastric emptying. And and these are the ones that we don't want to miss because they do suffer. And people. things that this is a functional dyspepsia and functional nausea and actually the treatment is easy which is actually have some supplements increase your weight and you will feel better and these are the kids that usually their weight is not proportional to their height yeah yeah so this is probably the ones that we don't want to miss right in a busy pediatric opd what would be your pointers for pediatricians to pick up eosinophilic gut disease uh, you know yeah. I mean, it's it's very presentation, and sometimes it's overdiagnosed, and sometimes it's underdiagnosed. But I think the uh, ones uh, that is presenting, uh, especially in in the context of the family history and the blood eosinophilia and the, the severe episode of pain that can present with the uh, gut eosinophil, or the children with eosinophil esophagitis, the ones who cannot really uh, swallow and have difficulty with swallowing, needing to drink lots of water to help them to swallow. Uh, with a background history of atopy and asthma, I think these are uh, the ones that we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't miss and we should uh, consider endoscopic assessment because at the end of the day it's a histological diagnosis. Right, and uh, in your case with the uh, GI hemorrhage, uh, I mean, uh, portal hypertension was a shunt done at American Hospital just. No, uh, in Leeds. So this is where I used to work in Leeds, which is a pediatric GI center. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Center. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yes, Mr. Diary. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's uh, it's done. Yeah, I think we have covered uh, most of the. I some of the questions the were question already answered in the yeah. lecture. And uh, 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 yeah, Doctor Kartikeyan. Will be sent to the email of Professor Davan and Doctor Dalia. I would like to thank Professor Davan, uh, Doctor Dalia, Doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we sit here till morning, they will ask yeah. question, and Doctor Davan, the way he's answering, really, 
I want to listen. I mean, the this morning we learned a lot. Actually, before Dr. Sora, be before we finish, in fact, I just wanted to ask Dr. Dhawan one question. I'm sorry please, about that. Please, please. Uh, it's nothing to do with the topic, but. Uh, you mentioned that in UK there are three centers that do the liver work. By that you mean liver transplantation? Because does this um, centralized system work for a nation better, uh, in your opinion? Absolutely. That's one good thing of NHS. The only thing we are proud of and the rest of the world is envious is centralization of pediatric liver disease to three centers only in UK. But don't you think that uh, there is a chance of uh, delayed diagnosis or... Uh, well, no? England is a small country, so we are not so, very big by distance. And the network system is very, very good. So once the patient has suspected, they have a geographical, you know, south of England, mid Midlands and north. Scotland decides whenever, wherever they want to go. Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland comes to us. So this is works extremely well. There is a DGHH which are linked with the hospitals and every no, nobody has to travel more than a few hours, let's put it that way, in the car. And people from Scotland and Ireland take a plane, so that also cuts down the journey time. We think the UK outcome of pediatric liver disease are the best in the world. Not that I'm practicing it, but there is a data to support it. And the, so, all the three centers follow the same protocols? It's no. like a... If you do that, that brings mediocrity. You need to be a bit different. So we need to have your own unique selling points. And if you did everything like a postal stamp, you know, stamp, 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 everything, that doesn't leave a room for innovation. So I'm protocol, I'm for protocol, but to a limited extent. Protocol stop innovation. So people need to be doing new things all the time. Sure. So if you just follow a protocol and agree to one outcome, then in, there is no innovation. So if you give an example outside this topic, we are the only one who give auxiliary transplants in UK, predominantly at King's, and avoid a lifelong immunosuppression for children with liver transplantation. The rest of the world is still about 20 years behind. Mm -hmm. Biliary easy outcomes are the best in UK compared to other centers. I'm sure they are catching up, but if you look at, and this is, the whole centralization comes from biliary atresia. So that's interesting question you asked. Because what was shown is if one center is doing less than five size a year, the outcomes were consistently not good. Mm -hmm. So that led to the centralization. Then there is the decentralization because of some of the surgeons were gifted surgeons. They were able to give good outcome with three surgeries. So then it happened a decentralization. Then again, the outcome started going bad because everybody started doing it. Then again, the centralization was brought. And I think for the last 20 years, nobody has bothered to go back again now. And it's so much established now. I don't think it will be very wrong to decentralize it, but you never know political things change. But at this point in time, there is one center in South of England, one in Midlands, one in North of England. So can we get an idea about how big is your uh, unit? So we, our unit is, uh, in terms of, we have 20 dedicated beds for just for liver disease. Uh, we have eight bedded intensive care unit and eight bedded HDU. So out of that, four and four are liver. So we do the highest number of liver transplant in the Western world, because China and India are difficult to beat. So in the Western world, in the, that is North America, means United States of America and rest of Europe. We do about 60 pediatric liver transplant per, per year and total of 95 transplants happen in UK. So you can do the maths. Yeah. Okay. So we do about 55 to 60% of the work for the whole UK, about 55% in terms of liver disease admission. So we have 11 full-time pediatric liver hepatologists, full-time liver consultants. They only do liver disease. They don't do gastroenterology. Okay. There are five professors and uh, four liver surgeons, transplant, and two pediatric hepatobiliary surgeons. Then there is a dedicated liver pathologist, a liver microbiologist, and four liver radiologists. So it's a very comprehensive system. And we have a basic science lab, which uh, Saurabh mentioned, Mobot lab, <coughs> which is a basic science lab that is in the translation. So we are looking at cellular therapies to treat acute liver, liver failure and metabolic liver disorders. So we were the first in the world to treat babies with acute liver failure with, my, my, with alginate beads in their abdominal cavities, avoiding a liver transplant. So, so protocols are one thing, but innovation shouldn't stop. And uh, we should be curious. We shouldn't settle for mediocrity. 
because that's what the protocols bring. And uh, if you settle for mediocrity, I'm not saying at the cost of outcomes, but it has to be, you know, we should be doing better on what we did last year. So that's how we work. Right. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, sir. Thank all the viewers uh, is saying till this time. I would like to thank Tofi for sponsoring once again. Thank you, Professor Dhawan, Dr. Dalia, Diari, Dr. Kalpana. Again, I'm sure the viewers uh, have benefited a lot. I learned many things. We we'll last, uh, I mean, request uh, folks to go in the future also to yeah. join us. Uh, well, I like to come to Dubai. Nice. I used to come every year, but I haven't been there for the last year. So <laughs> now I think travel both ways is not possible. Yeah, in it's UK not, to yeah. UAE. Not, I love you traveling. So over to you, uh, Mr. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Anil and Dr. Dalia, for the excellent presentation. Uh, so, uh, one thing about the certificate, so like the CME accreditation is still under process. So, the uh, certificate for this program will be delayed a bit. Okay, so please bear with us. So, we'll be, I'll be trying to send it as soon as possible once uh, we get the accreditation from Ministry of Health. Until then, so for next program, so March 12th, sorry, no, February 12th. February, February, 20th. Sorry, the 12th February, inshallah. So until then, goodbye to all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good, good night. night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Good to see you all. And those old fellows, you know, got the names back. It looks like they were all here. Dali, I think I can recognize you now, but mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. I haven't met you in person, but I think I recognize you now from the past meetings in London. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you for all. Okay.